turn your Bibles to Leviticus chapter 9, if you would. We're actually going to pick up two chapters again tonight, so hang on. We're going to go through chapter 9 and then into chapter 10. Now, last week, if you were here, we were sitting in chapter 8, and we've seen this consecration of Aaron and his sons taking place. Everything was getting put into action. All these chapters before, as God spoke to Moses, how the sacrifices were going to be, hadn't happened yet, guys. This is the beginning here. There is a beginning that happens, and they are consecrated now. Aaron and his sons, and Moses led them through this whole thing in chapter 8, doing just as the Lord had commanded Moses. He anointed them. He anointed the tabernacle. He anointed them. They did some sacrifices. They pre- preparation, right? All this preparation for service for, for Aaron and his two sons, Aaron being the high priest and them being priests also. Aaron and his two sons now are set apart in holiness unto God through this consecration. Aaron and his two sons are consecrated to the Lord. What is that? Well, just what I said, set apart, holy unto the Lord, consecrated. It's an ongoing process that will continue for them over and over and over again. We're going to see that tonight. There's going to be more sacrifices for them personally, these priests. You know, in chapter 9, we'll see that, like I say, continue. After seven days, as we read in chapter 8, after seven days of sitting there at the door of the tabernacle, they've been consecrated. Now they've been told, stay there seven days, do not depart. They're at the door of the tabernacle. Go back to chapter 8, verse 31. Let's just pick that up real quick. And Moses said to Aaron and his sons, boil uh, boil the flesh at the door of the tabernacle of the meeting and eat it there with the bread that is in the basket of the consecration offering as a command, as as I commanded, saying, Aaron and his sons shall eat. What remains of the flesh and of the bread you shall burn with fire and you shall not go outside the door of the tabernacle of meeting for seven days, he says until the days of your consecration are ended. For seven days he shall consecrate you, right? The seven-day period of time. As he has done this day, so the Lord has commanded to do to make atonement for you. Therefore, you shall stay at the door of the tabernacle of the meeting uh, day and night for seven days and keep the charge of the Lord so that you may not die. Uh, For so I have been commanded. So Aaron and his sons did all the things that the Lord had commanded by the hand of Moses. Yet, they've done all this. They're still going to be more to do as we're going to pick up in chapter 9. There's going to be more to do. There's going to be more sin to its home for. After seven days, after everything we read in, in, in chapter 8 and all the sacrifices they did for that and the consecration, there's still going to be more to do to atone. Why, church? Why? They are still sinners. Seven days or seven years sitting there does not matter. They are sinners. And that time that they spent there in seven days, guess what? They sinned. We're all sinners. We all fall short of the glory of God. You think they sat there for seven days and went, thought every good thought? You think they were in total obedience to the Lord? No. Just like we're not every day. What goes through our minds? Boy, this thing could get pretty crazy. I don't know about you. This thing could get pretty crazy, right? What you might think about, amen? They're still sinners. I don't care, seven days, seven years. See, all these sacrifices that they'd done, no animal would be perfect enough. We know that. No blood would be good enough. No offering would be strong enough to totally atone for their sin. Now, for the Christian. We don't necessarily, we do use the word consecrate sometimes, but we really use the word sanctify, right? To be sanctified in the Lord. We use that word, sanctified by the blood of Jesus. We are sanctified by Jesus' blood. Obviously, Jesus' blood was perfect enough. Jesus' blood was good enough. 
Jesus' blood was strong enough. Jesus' blood was the only thing that could totally atone for sin. They didn't have that. The children of Israel, you see. We use this word sanctified. So how is it different? How is it really different? Well, obviously, I just said, Jesus' perfect sacrifice. The unspotted and perfect Lamb of God who died upon the cross once and for all, one time, one time sacrifice. Hebrews 10.10. 10. By that, we will have been sanctified, right? The word sanctified. By that, will we have been sanctified through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ once and for all. Jesus was the perfect sacrifice and always will be the final sacrifice for our sanctification. Holy and set apart as these priests needed to be, you see. Holy and set apart by Jesus for the Christian. Now, is our sanctification then complete? Is it all done? By the blood of Jesus, is our sanctification complete? Yes and no. Okay? Yes and no, of course. Of course Jesus' blood covers us. Of course you're saved. You're a believer in Christ. Of course that part is. But there's a work in progress. See, sanctification is a work in progress within the Christian. Sanctification continues as you grow in Christ, as you grow in his word, as you mature in the spirit. That sanctification continues through you. You grow spiritually and you mature spiritually. A, a work, right? It's a work that God does in us and Jesus does in us. And he promises he will complete it too. In 2 Peter 3.18, it says, but grow first, grow first in the grace and the knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. You know, I think really for a lot of Christians, they need to grow in that grace. Understand grace, unmerited favor that you have been given. Receive that grace. Live by that grace. Give that grace to others. Amen. Give it to others too. But grow in the grace and the knowledge. The knowledge of our Lord, Savior, Jesus Christ. And of course, he says, to him be the glory, both now and forever. Amen and amen. A work that is started that is promised to be complete also. Philippians 1.6. I love this scripture, guys. Highlight it, write it down. I love this scripture. You being confident of this very thing, that he, he, Jesus Christ, who has began a good work in you, will complete it. He'll complete that sanctification, that maturity in you until the day of Jesus Christ. Whether it is Jesus comes and takes you, we get all raptured together, great, that's when it's complete, or whether you go to the grave. At that time, it's complete. It's good. It's all good. Like I say, the Christian life is a continuing, continuing sanctification. It's a lifelong work, growing, right? Growing and maturing. It's a beautiful thing, really. You know, Jesus prayed in John 17, one of the most beautiful prayers. All of John 17 is Jesus' prayer before he went to the cross. And one of those things he, he prayed to the Father, he prayed that God would sanctify us. And how does he sanctify us? By, by in truth, by his word. In John 17, 17, it'd be on the screen, Jesus prayed, he said, sanctify them by your truth. By your truth, guys. This is truth right here. By your truth. Sanctify them. By your truth, your word is truth. How are we sanctified? You understand when you read the word of God and you understand and you let the word of God work in your life, it's part of your sanctification. You grow. You get more mature. You're able to share some of it. And I got a wonderful phone call from a brother on Sunday afternoon and how God put an opportunity for him. Remember the boat and the net and everything? to cast the net, right, to be a fisher of men. And he was all excited. I was excited for him, too. I said, awesome. And he says, man, he says, the Holy Spirit just led me in it, gave me what to say. And I said, yeah, that's the way it works. That's exactly the way it works. You don't even know what you said when you get done. All you know is that for him, he got to lead this gentleman in a sinner's prayer and give him hope, right? 
Give him hope. Sanctify them by your truth. Your word is truth. Now Israel, as we continue our study here, for Israel there, their, sacri uh, their, their sacrifices would be daily, right? They're going to have to sacrifice daily. And atone daily for these sins. Even the priests, see, even these high priests, Aaron and his sons, even them, they are subject to sin. So they have to atone for it constantly. Seven days of waiting they have spent now. Seven days and still sinners. They're going to continue these sacrifices that we read into chapter 9 for the priest and the people. We're going to see that. Let's pray. Father God, just thank you, Lord, as we gather here tonight, as we study in Leviticus. Bring it to life for us, Lord, through your word. Uh, give it applications into our own lives, Jesus. In Jesus' name, amen. So the title of my message tonight, you know, I love God's Word. I got to tell you, I love God's Word. I get studying, and all of a sudden, God goes, bam, let me show you something in the New Testament, what this is kind of speaking about here. The title of my message tonight is Remove the Plank. Now you're going to understand it after a bit here. It's called Remove the Plank. Go into chapter 9. We're going to read through the verse, seven verses here, okay? Now it came to pass on the eighth day, seven days, they're in front of the, the tabernacle, yet the door of the tabernacle. And it came to pass on the eighth day that Moses called Aaron and his sons and the elders of Israel, the elders, okay? Two million people there, these elders of the different tribes. Elders in actually translation in the Old Testament meant the bearded, gray bearded ones, okay? So they were the old men. Uh, I see some gray out there. I don't see a lot of beards, but I see some gray out there. So you're the elders, right? This is who they were, these elders of Israel. And he said to Aaron, take for yourself a young bull. He's saying to Aaron again, we just went through this. Take for yourself a young bull as a sin offering and a ram as a burnt offering without blemish and offer them before the Lord. And to the children of Israel, you shall speak, saying, take a kid of goats as a sin offering and a calf and a lamb, both of the first year, without a blemish. This is to the people, right? He's going to tell these elders this, and they're going to tell the people. Without a blemish, it's a burnt offering. Also, a bull and a ram as peace offerings to sacrifice before the Lord, and a grain of offering mixed with oil, for today the Lord will appear to you. Wow, that's a cool promise, right? All of a sudden, you're, you're going to see something special on this particular day. So they brought, uh, they brought what Moses commanded before the tabernacle of meeting, and all the congregation now drew near and stood before the Lord. Then Moses said, This is the thing which the Lord commanded you to do, and the glory of the Lord then will appear to you. And Moses said to Aaron, Go to the altar, offer your sin on right? Offer your sin offering. He's speaking to Aaron first. Aaron needs to go first. After all this time, seven days, and all the sacrifices they did before that, here again, he tells them, he says there, and Moses said to Aaron, go to the altar, offer your sin offering and your burnt offering, and make atonement for yourself, and then for the people, offer the offering of the people and make atonement for them, as the Lord had commanded. So as I say, here we have, we've had seven days of consecration. This has taken place. Patiently, fellowshipping with the Lord. Aaron and his two boys are sitting there, fellowshipping with the Lord. They're eating during this time, too. And that's part of fellowship, right? We eat when we fellowship. Fellowship with the Lord, and they're having this time patiently for these seven days. Now comes the eighth day. This eighth day, a day of new beginnings, a day of new beginnings for Israel, a day for new beginnings for an entire nation, as all this stuff is going to start taking place, right? As this time is going to take place, Aaron and his sons are now these priests, right? They're priests. 
Israel now has those to go before the Lord and do all the sacrifices. None of that's taken place yet. This is a day of new beginning. It's a new day for Israel. And it was really, I mean, you got to understand the gravity of it. They've been out in the desert. They've done all this. Remember the building of the tabernacle, getting all the stuff together. And now, bam, we're going to start this, this time of the tabernacle. And what does it begin with? It begins with a sacrifice. For who? It's going to start with you, Aaron. It's going to start with Aaron. It's going to start with your sin. It's going to start, Aaron, with the plank in your eye. Remove the plank. Turn your Bibles, please, to Matthew chapter 7, if you would, please. This is where God took me, blew me away. I'm tapping away, putting down some notes. And I went here, remove the plank. Go to Matthew chapter 7 as Jesus speaks. Powerful scripture right here, guys. Matthew chapter 7, beginning in verse 1. Every Christian and every non-Christian alike knows this first part because they'll repeat it to you, let me tell you. They don't understand it, but they'll repeat it. Judge not that you, uh, I'm, judge not that you be not judged. Everybody says, well, you can't judge me. All right. What's Jesus actually saying? He says, condemn not that you not be condemned. That word in translation is condemn not, not judge. And so, for with what judgment you judge, you will be judged. And with what measure you use, it will be measured back to you. And why do you look at this speck in your brother's eye, but do not consider the plank in your own eye? Right? Do not consider that plank that's in your own eye. You're looking at your brother's speck, amen? Or how can you say to your brother, let me remove the speck from your eye, and look, a plank is in your eye. A plank is in your own eye. How are you going to minister to that one? How are you going to help that one, right? He says they're hypocrite. I love that. Oh, man. Hypocrite. Hypocrite, Jesus says, first you remove the plank from your own eye, and then you will clearly, uh, you will see clearly to remove the speck from your brother's eye. Look at your own sin first. Get that before the Lord. Sacrifice, Moses, Moses, Aaron, we see, it starts with him. He's going to be doing this work for the children of Israel, going on their behalf. Get the plank, remove that plank out of his eye first. Remove, and then you're able to help others, you see. In verse 8, go back now. We're going to bounce back and forth on that. You don't have to keep your finger there. But anyway. As you remove the plank, in verse 8 now, continues on. And Aaron therefore went to the altar and killed the calf of the sin offering, which was for himself, right? For himself first. Then he, uh, the sons of Aaron brought the blood to him, and he dipped his finger in the blood, put it on the horns of the altar, and poured the blood at the base of the altar, but the fat and the kidneys and the fatty lobes from the liver and the sin offering he burned on the altar as the Lord had commanded Moses. The flesh and the hide he burned with fire outside the camp. And he killed the burnt offering, and Aaron's sons presented to him the blood, which he sprinkled all around on the altar. Then he presented the burnt offering to him. Uh, then they presented the burnt offering to, to him with its pieces in its head and it burned them on the altar. And he washed the entrails and the legs and burned them with a burnt offering on the altar, it says, to verse 14. So we see here Aaron, Aaron preparing himself first, right? He's removing the plank. Before he can go before the Lord with all the, the, the sacrifices and whatnot for the children of Israel, first thing he has to do is for himself to remove the plank from his own eye. Right? Get that out of the way. Anytime you want to minister to somebody, guys, anytime you want to minister, you want to go before the Lord first, and you want to get that out of the way. Because, see, when you've got a big plank in your eye, you can't see too well to help that one. Help that one. I've been guilty of it, right? I've been guilty of it. I'll hold my hand up. Remove the plank. And he had to prepare himself before he could give any of the attention to the people and help them. 
to lovingly help them, you see. He had to remove that plank. We too cannot lead others, help others at all, if we're not first getting right before the Lord in everything in our lives, right? I'm not saying you're, you're, you're going to be sin-free. No, we're all sinners, of course. But first, we have to be right before the Lord, that God can use us then to help that other. How do we do that? Repent. Simple. Repent. Take it before the Lord. Give it over to the Lord, and then God can use us. What turns off an unbeliever, right? What turns off an unbeliever? Hypocritical Christianity. Amen? Hypocritical. What Jesus said, you hypocrite. You got a plank in your eye. What turns off the unbeliever, that hypocritical Christianity, that self-righteous Christian? Oh, man, look at me. I'm a Christian. You need this. And they look at your lifestyle, and they see a hypocrite. Turns off the unbeliever. Ones that preach Jesus and do not live what they preach. Amen? You're preaching Jesus, and then you don't live it. And for Aaron, it was really important. You know, Aaron's held to a higher standard as any pastor to understand that the standard that God has for those that teach the word compared to those that hear the word. Amen? But the ones that, in general, preach Jesus, they don't live Jesus. Ones with planks in their eyes. Remove the plank. In Matthew 7, 5, that'll be it back on the screen. Hypocrite, he says. First, remove the plank from your own eye, and then you'll be see clearly to remove the speck of your brother's eye. Where are we on that? Where are you personally? That's something between you and God, right? Got a plank in your eye? Get it removed. Where are we? Are we hypocrites? You know, are we, are we one with eyes full of planks within the, within the body of Christ, within the church? It's a serious question. That quote that was in the beginning of that song by Brandon Manning, the greatest single cause of atheism in the world today is Christians who acknowledge Jesus with their lips and walk out the door and then deny him by their lifestyle. That is what an unbelieving world simply finds. Unbelievable. That is a powerful quote, man. Very powerful quote. And exactly that. You know, there's a saying. Your life may be the only Bible someone ever reads. You understand? Your life and your lifestyle and your witness unto others may be the only Bible they ever read. They literally read the Bible, God, Jesus' commandments through you. What are they reading? Amen. What are they reading? Go into verse 15 now as we move along. Then he brought the people's offering. Took his own first, right? Got his plank out of his eyes. Then he took the people's offering and took the goat, which was the sin offering for the people, and killed it and offered it for sin like the first one. And he brought the burnt offering and offered it according to the prescribed manner. Then he brought the green offering, took a handful of it, and burned it on the altar beside the burnt sacrifice of the morning. Verse 18, he also killed the bull and the ram as sacrifices a peace offering, which were for the people. And Aaron's sons presented to him the blood, which he sprinkled all around the altar, and the fat of the bull and the ram and the fatty tail which covered the entrails and the kidneys and the fatty lobe attached to the liver and they put the fat on the breast and they burned it on the altar but, uh, but the breast and, and the right uh, uh, thigh Aaron waved his wave offering remember that last week talking about a wave offering and a heave offering heaving it up to the Lord you know and the wave offering going this way and I said how you know it actually makes the sign of the cross man to God and man to man in the wave offering. Anyway, continue on. So this offering before the Lord as Moses had commanded. Then Aaron lifted his hand toward the people. Oh, this is beautiful, guys. He's doing all this, right? It's all coming down, man. It's a, it's a new beginning in Israel. Then Aaron lifted his hand toward the people and he blessed them and came down from the offering, the sin offering, a burnt offering, a peace offering. And then Moses and Aaron went into the tabernacle of meeting and then they came out and blessed the people. Then the glory of the Lord appeared to all the people. They 
got their plank out of their eye and they're coming out and they're blessing the people. And the fire came out before the Lord and consumed the burnt offering, offering and the fat on the altar. When all the people saw it, well, they shouted and they fell on their faces. Amen. They fell on their faces. Yeah. They went down. Wow. Aaron offers this sacrifice for the entire nation of Israel. You see what's taking place here? There was a sacrifice, all these things, you know, uh, the, you know, in order as God had commanded, but it is for the entire nation of Israel, all these people. What had to take place first? What had to take place first, though, right? His own cleansing. His own cleansing. Before he could offer all this for the entire nation. His own sacrifice and removing the plank beforehand. Second Chronicles 7.14 If my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and then seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven and will forgive their sins and heal their land. What has to take place first till today? The church. Repentance within the church, you see. If my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, repent. Where do we stand today in the church? American church, where do we stand? You know, do we stand in this planks in all the eyes? Right? A bunch of planks in our eyes, a bunch of hypocrites within the American church. And we're, hey, and there's a few of them praying, oh God, heal our land, change the government, do all this stuff. And there's still the wicked ways and they haven't humbled themselves and they haven't prayed fervently. Moses, I mean Moses, Aaron, he first got the plank out of his own eye, humbled himself, amen? He humbled himself. And he turned from his wicked ways and, he, and wicked ways, and he repented. And now he's able, he had his own cleansing. And now he's able to pray and lift up the whole nation of Israel in these sacrifices. Go back to verse 23 real quick here in chapter 9. It says there, Then Aaron lifted his hand toward the people, and he blessed them. And came down from offering the sin offering, the burnt offering, the peace offering. I'm sorry, verse 23. And Moses and Aaron went into the tabernacle meeting and came out and blessed the people. Then the glory of the Lord appeared to all the people. You see? They went in there and then they come out and they bless. And then it appeared to the people. And the fire came out from before the Lord consumed the burnt offering and the fat altar went on the altar. And when all the people saw it, they shouted and fell on their faces. Moses and Aaron were petitioning for the people, as it says in Chronicle. They were praying for the people. And what did the people see then? They saw the glory of the Lord. What can we see in our nation? If my people, if my people will step from their wicked ways, the people saw the glory of the Lord. How can we see the glory of the Lord within our nation? Guys, we gotta take this, we gotta take this and bring it into today, right? That's what it's all about. You know, the, the, the Old Testament conceals what the New Testament reveals, right? And I looked at that and I said, oh, plank in the eye, man. Bunch of hypocritical Christians professing to be some self-righteous. And all those planks and all the sin within the, own, within the church, we got to pray and live lives that show it, right? Move individually our own plank, amen? And then petition God. For our land. I love my land. I love America. I love God more, I can tell you that. Verse 24. When all saw it, it says there, and the fire came out from before the Lord and consumed it. When all the people saw it, they shouted and they fell on their faces. When all saw it, they fell on their faces. They bowed the knee. They were prostrated out before the, on the ground, face down on the ground, amen? Shouted, I don't know what they shouted, like, ah! Or just, yay, or what it was, but they shouted, they fell on the ground. 
They bowed the knee. In Philippians 2, 10 and 11, we're told there that in the name of Jesus, every knee should bow of those in heaven and those on earth and those under the earth, and that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Amen. Better bow now. Amen. Within our land, within the church even, better bow now freely. You can bow now freely. Receive Jesus. Or you're going to be forced to your knee in that day. Turn your Bibles if you like. Go to Revelation, way back in the back. Revelation chapter 19. Ah, by the way, we see a little picture of us, the church. Revelation 19 is it at the end of the tribulation. Uh, seven-year period. That seven-year period, if you believe in Jesus, if you're here, you won't be here. Amen. We'll be up with, with the Lord in that time, but then we get to come back down with, uh, well, we're going to read it here with our Lord. In uh, verse uh, 11 of chapter 19, John writes, Now I saw heaven open, and behold, a white horse, and he who sat on him called Faithful and True, in righteousness he judges and makes war. His eyes were like flame of fire, and on his head were many crowns. He had a name written that no one, except him, uh, that no one knew except himself. He was clothed with a robe dipped in blood, and his name is called the Word of God. Amen. Jesus, the Word. From the beginning, the word. And the armies in heaven, clothed in fine linen, white and clean, followed him on white horses. Yeehaw! That's you. All right? If you get to heaven, yeehaw! We follow him on these white horses. Talk to Terry there about learning to ride, by golly. Now, out of the mouth goes a sharp sword, and with it he would strike the nations, and he himself would rule them with a rod of iron. He himself treads the winepress of a fierceness and the wrath of Almighty God, and he has on his robe and on his thigh a name, King of kings and Lord of lords. Amen. That's powerful. I don't know. I could read that over and over and over. That's our Jesus, guys. Hmm. Go back now. Head on back to Leviticus. We're going to go into chapter 10 here. Yeah. Oh, they fell on their faces all right. Seen the glory of the Lord. Hmm. Those who don't receive Jesus, they're going to be on their faces. That's not going to be a good time. The tribulation. Don't let your family go in the tribulation. And if they do, leave them a note. Right? If I suddenly am gone, leave them a letter. If I'm suddenly gone... Everything I told you, hopefully you told them, right, it has taken place. We have been taken. The church has been taken. Get on your knees. Receive Jesus Christ. By the way, I left this Bible for you, and I highlighted some things in here for you. Understand, right? Leave that for your for family members, amen? Go into chapter 10 now. We got to move. Chapter 10. Okay, then, after this happened, then the dab. And Abihu, the sons of Aaron, each took his censer and put fire in it and put incense on it and offered now profane fire before the Lord. Profane fire, which he had not commanded. So fire went out from the Lord and devoured them, and they died before the Lord. I read that last week, remember? <laughs> Better keep his commands or else. And I read that little portion right there, those first two verses. What were they thinking? What's with these two boys here? This was not ordered by the Lord. God started the fire. God put the fire out there, right? This was not God's fire. They lit their own censers, created their own things, and lit the fire. And by the way, most likely, most commentators said they went into the holies of holies. They went in past the curtain with the Ark of the Covenant, right? What were they thinking here, these boys? What motivated them by any means? What was it? Was it some kind of pride maybe, you know? Was it just, boy, we're really ambitious young guys, you know? We want to go in there and we want to, we want to impress somebody. Was it maybe jealousy that Aaron maybe is getting all the attention? We're just doing the little things and he's doing the big things. What was it? Were they just impatient, you know? They went in there, they brought in, made their own fire, their censers, and they put some, you know, the, the incense on it. Maybe they were bored of all the repetition 
Have you guys been bored of all the repetition all the way from chapter one as we get into here? Maybe you've been bored. No, what was it, you know? Maybe they were just bored. Maybe they wanted to try something new. Hmm? Oh man, we're gonna try something new. We, we got a new way. Let's do it a new way. A new way to go before God. Hey, we made this up. We'll just do this new way. Many, many, many look for a new way, church. Many over the years look for a new way. There's churches today. We got a new way to come before God, amen? We got a new thing going on here. We got some new fire. It's all of God. Is it? Is it? Hmm. Itching to try something new. Got to have something new, something exciting, something new. You know what? This word of God is getting kind of old, getting kind of boring. His commands are getting boring. Maybe we can bring a new Jesus in. We can get a whole new Jesus here. Many look for that. You know, I want to say beware, beware, beware. I told a good friend of mine today, I said, you walk right on by that, uh, what's that called, the 180, right down there on Gurley Street? Yeah, you know what I'm talking about, Bill. Yeah, I said, he says, well, I'm coming up to this. I was going to go pick him up downtown. And I said, you just keep walking past that and go to the DAV. I'll pick you up at the DAV, man. Don't let those Potter House get a hold of you. They got a new way, right? I shouldn't say it that way. But anyway, beware. God's not impressed with new ways. God's not impressed with new gods. In 2 Timothy chapter 4, it says there, for the time will come. It's amazing. The prophecy. Paul told Timothy, the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine, but according to their own desires, because they have these itching ears, they'll heap up for themselves teacher, and they will turn their, way, their ears away from the truth and be turned aside to fables. We got a new way, man. Let me tell you about the new way to God. Aaron's sons, my, maybe they're caught up in the moment. I don't know what's going on here. Wow, I think we'll do this, you know. Let's just light some fire and walk in here. Our own fire. Maybe we can create our own fire. This was profane. Man's profane fire, All right? Think about it. Ooh, we got the Holy Spirit fire in the church. Is that man's fire? Is that God's fire? God can move powerfully in his Holy Spirit within a church. But is that man's fire or is that God's fire? We have to question that. Is it some kind of experimental fire and not God's fire? I have a quote here. It says, the fire on the altar of the burnt offering was sacred because it was kindled by God himself, you see. It was kindled by God. It was sacred. Nadab and Abihu offered a fire of their own making. Perhaps they thought that all fire was the same, and an undiscerning person may have agreed with them. But all fire isn't the same, and there is a huge difference between the fire kindled by God and a fire conjured up by man. Oh, I tell you what, all you got to do is get on TV in a while, and you can see some fire conjured up by man. What can be our profane fire? Okay, let's come back to us. All right? Let's just come back to us. Well, we know Jesus. We're not wanting a new way, right? What can be our profane fire? Anything and everything, I want to say, that's not of God, guys. That's not in his will. Got another uh, commentator here, McLaren. He says, our censors, our censors are often flaming with strange fire, he goes. How much so-called Christians worship glows with self-will or with partisan zeal when we seek to worship God for what we can get, I'll come worship you, Lord. What can I get out of you? For what we can get. When we rush into his presence with hot, eager desires, which we have not subordinated to his will. Man, when you pray, pray in God's will. Ask that God, it be his will. Ask the Holy Spirit to help you pray in God's will, not in your will, not what you can get. He says, are we burning strange fire which he has not commanded? I just thought that was a great quote there. Well, you got to move on. Verse 3 now. Mm. Verse 3, chapter 10. <sighs> Boys went, pew. They got burnt. Actually, this fire, guys, 
It's not like they got devoured by the fire. We'll see that. Fire in the Old Testament many times is related to lightning. They were probably hit with lightning, right, from God. And Moses said to Aaron, this is what the Lord spoke, saying, by those who come near me, I must be regarded as holy. And before all the people, I must be glorified. Hey, those who come near me, I must be regarded as holy. And before all the people, I must be glorified. So Aaron held his peace. <laughs> he held his peace about all this stuff, right, going on. Then Moses called uh, Mishael and Elzaphan, the sons of Uzel, the, the uncle of Aaron, and said to them, Come near, carry your brethren from here before the, sa- uh, before the sanctuary out of the camp. So they went near and they carried them by their tunics. You see, it didn't like it burned their tunics even. You can get struck by lightning and you still have your clothes on, right? <laughs> yeah, but you're dead. And by their tunics and out the camp, as Moses had said. And Moses said to Aaron and to Eleazar and uh, I- Ithamar, his sons, Do not uncover your heads nor tear your clothes lest you die. Do not mourn for these two is what he's saying. Do not mourn for them unless you die. And the wrath come upon all the people. But let your brethren, the whole house of Israel, bewail the burning which the Lord has kindled. You shall not go out from the door of the tabernacle of the meeting lest you die. For the anointing oil of the Lord is upon you. And they did according to the word of Moses. Wow. Wow. Get that profane fire out of here. That's what Moses said. Get that profane fire out of here. And don't you mourn about it. You know, over the years, and and this might sound kind of harsh, right? You can have somebody come within the church, and they become this profane fire, right? Get it out of here. My pastor used to say, hey, those are blessed subtractions. They start causing problems. They start whispering in ears. Maybe they're trying a new way. And he says, you know, sometimes God just takes care of that, and you just look at that, and maybe you've, maybe, maybe you've befriended them a little, and all of a sudden they're gone. But sometimes it's blessed subtractions, guys. Get that profane fire out of here. In verse 3, read that again. It says, by those who come near me, I must be regarded as holy, and before all the people, I must be glorified. Many think they can come their own way before the Lord, right? I went into that. Many think they can come their own way and do their own thing. You know, me and the big man upstairs, we mates. Oh, that irritates me. Tell me, you and the big man upstairs, that is the creator of heaven and earth who is the almighty judge of you. He's not a big man upstairs. Don't don't be uh, taking my Lord name in vain. By the way, that's taking the Lord's name in vain. Doing something like that, absolutely. That big man. (sighs) I don't need the word. I don't need to go to church. I can come to the Lord anywhere I want. I can go worship him on a hill. Yeah, you can go worship on a hill. By the way, the Bible says don't forsake the gathering of the saints. By the way, the Bible says that we are stronger as a unit. Amen? And the Bible says these things. I don't need his word. I don't need to read his word. I know my God. Do you? Do you know your God, really? They want to go come their own way, right? No, Moses said here... By those who come near me, I must be regarded as holy first. And before all the people, I must be glorified. True, we come as we are. Understand that. We come as we are. We come as sinners. But we must come the way provided. Jesus, period. We come by Jesus. You don't get to God without going through Jesus. I'm sorry. You know, you can't just go up on a hill and look at the beautiful sunrise and say, yep, there's God, there's a creator there. And forget Jesus. Jesus makes us holy. Jesus makes us righteous. Jesus makes us presentable. Not our own fire by any means. Nothing we can do. In 1 Timothy 2, it says, For there is one God and one mediator between God and man, the man Christ Jesus. There is only one way. I am the way, the truth, and the life, Jesus says, right? He is a way. People cannot make their own way to God. Come as you are, yes, sinners saved by grace. Amen. Understand that. You are a sinner saved by grace. You do not deserve it. Come through Jesus. Ephesians 2, 8. It says, for by grace you have been saved through faith. Not of yourself. It's a gift of God. Not of works lest anyone should boast. 
we can't work our way to Jesus either. There's nothing you can do. You can't tithe your way to Jesus. You can't do good works on your way to Jesus. It is all of the heart. We come and receive the grace. Amen? Okay, we're going to get on to verse 8. Now, the Lord is going to whisper something in Aaron's ear here. He's going to speak to Aaron. You notice he's been speaking to Moses. He speaks to Aaron. Hey, come over here, Aaron. i got something to tell you, right? In verse 8, Then the Lord spoke to Aaron, saying, Do not drink wine or intoxicating drink, you nor your sons with you, when you go into the tabernacle of the meeting, lest you die. It shall be a statute forever throughout your generations that you may distinguish, that you will be able to understand, distinguish between holy and unholy, he says. God's telling them this. And between unclean and clean. And that you may teach the children of Israel all the statutes that the Lord has spoken to them by the hand of Moses. <gasps> oh, maybe now we see what happened to his boys. They were drunk. Good possibility they were drunk. Now we see this problem. His sons were probably taking the wine. Hey, brother, let's get us some, some, you know, our torches, and we'll get some fire on there, throw some inside. We can go behind the curtain, too. Yeah, it's wine in them, right? It's a good possibility they were not sober-minded. You see, the Lord told, told Aaron then, he said, never, ever again. You come into this, do you not, do not drink wine in this tabernacle. Do, do not come in here this way. I think it's what happened to his son, guys. You know, many in the ministry, many pastors, you know, say, well, a little alcohol is okay. Ah, a pastor can drink, you know. And I just look at them and I say, really? Really? I have many things like that, guys. I'm sorry. You know, when a pastor starts saying that's something that is a pastor, Right? A pastor starts saying something that's not biblical. I just look at him and said, do you ever read the Word of God? You know, seriously, do you read the Word of God? Do you understand the Word of God? 1 Timothy 3, a bishop, right? A pastor, Paul told him, must be blameless, the husband of one, wife, temperate, sober-minded, a good behavior, hospital, able to teach, not giving a wine. Boom, there you go, Pastor. Can you understand that? By the way, the next verse says, for the elders and deacons not giving them much wine, so don't tell me. Don't tell me it's just, you know, not addicted to wine. That's what they'll say. Titus 1.7, same thing. For a bishop must be blameless as a steward of God, not self-willed, not quick-tempered, not given to wine. Not given to wine. Is that only for in the church? Is that it? Well, I just, I would not come here smelling of alcohol. I wouldn't come into this church and teach. After I've been drinking, is that only for the, when you come in the church? By the way, pastors are pastors 24-7, period. They have to understand that. They need to be sober-minded, and I believe this is what God was speaking to them about. Go on to verse 12 now. And Moses spoke to Aaron and Eleazar and Ithmar, his sons, who were left... <laughs> Take the grain offering that remains of the offering made by fire to the Lord and eat it without leaven beside the altar. For it is most holy. You shall eat it in a holy place because it is your due and your son's due. And sacrifice is made by fire to the Lord. For so I have commanded the breast of the wave offering and the thigh of the heave offering. You shall eat in a clean place, uh, your sons and your daughters with you, for they are due. Uh, they are your due and your sons due, which are given from the sacrifices of the peace offering of the children of Israel. The thigh of the heave offering, the breast offering of the wave offering shall bring with the offering of the fat made of the flour to offer as a wave offering before the Lord. It shall be yours and your sons. You know, basically they got fed through this, right? Your sons with you by statute forever as the Lord had commanded. Then Moses made careful inquiry, though. He made this inquiry. Hey, I see something about the goat of the sin offering. There it was. It was all burned up. It was burned up. And he was angry now with Eleazar and Ithmar, the sons of Aaron, who were left saying, why have you not eaten the sin offering in the holy place? This, this goat, right? Sin is most holy, and God has given it to you to bear the guilt of the congregation and make atonement for them before the Lord. See, its blood was not brought inside the holy place. Indeed, you should have eaten it in a holy place, as I commanded. And then Aaron steps up, and Aaron said to Moses, Look, look, 
Moses, look, this day they have offered their sin offering and their burnt offering before the Lord. And such things have befallen me. All right? He's just talking about his sons. Talking about what took place with his sons, the ones that got zapped, right? If I had eaten the sin offering today, would it have been accepted in the sight of the Lord? So Moses, when Moses heard that, it was contempt. He was contempt. Aaron and these other ones, he did not eat the goat offering. He just let it all burn. Why? Why? He wasn't allowed to mourn his sons, you see. He wasn't allowed to mourn them. Basically, that's what Moses told him there. Wasn't allowed to tear his clothes. Wasn't allowed to put dust on his head. Wasn't allowed to mourn them. He needed this. He needed this. And of course, Moses understood, right? He needed a fast from that offering. Aaron could not eat. He could not eat with the right heart. Amen. He could not eat with the right heart because he was in mourning, really. And he couldn't be right before the Lord. He said, if I'd eaten the sin offering today, would it have been accepted in the sight of the Lord, you see? He was worried that this would not be accepted because his, his heart was not right in the sight of the Lord, you see? Maybe Aaron was a little angry. What happened, God? Maybe... Maybe Aaron had a bitter heart a little bit there. Aaron needed, to, Aaron needed a chance to get right before God again, to remove the plank, okay? To get right before God because that plank was in his eye again. He was hurting. He'd get his own heart right. You know, church, I would never tell anyone how long to mourn, right? But is there excessiveness? Can there be excessiveness of mourning? See, Aaron needed his heart right before the Lord before he could continue on. So what was wrong? What was wrong with his heart? Well, number one, he wasn't trusting in God's will. He wasn't trusting in God. So for those today who struggle for a long, 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 long time with mourning, are you trusting God in everything? Are you trusting God in his perfect will and his perfect timing and everything else? You see, get your heart right. Come before the Lord and move on. Amen. Like I say, it's a hard subject for a pastor to speak about. But at times, it needs to be spoken about. I want to read a couple of things here, and then we're going to end this. <sighs> we often find it easy to burn the sin offering and hard to eat it. Burning hard against sin in a judging manner is easy. He says, then, to sit down with a brother or sister as a fellow sinner, and partake of the sin offering with them, means now you realize uh, you aren't any better than them. Going back to that hypocrisy again. Only this kind of heart can minister to people. And see, that's what, that's what Aaron needed to re regain. It wasn't in any position. It wasn't in any position. God can use your experience, and maybe it's in mourning, Right? When you all of a sudden, man, you're just freed from that. God has shown you great things. And guess what? He puts somebody before you who needs, who needs help with that speck in their eyes because their heart's not right before the Lord because they're going, why did you take my loved one? Or questioning God and his sovereignty, amen? One more thing here. Jesus had this kind of heart, it says. Only this kind of heart can minister to people. Jesus had this kind of heart, even though he had no sin. He still identified with his people in his humble birth, simple life, baptism, and death. Moses said the sin offering was given to bear the guilt of the congregation to make atonement for them before the Lord. That's why he was upset, though, with Aaron. 
because he didn't eat it, because you're not taking care of the people right now. But see, Moses couldn't. He couldn't do it. He was flesh. That's why he was upset with Aaron. He didn't eat it. But then the commentator says, but Jesus did eat the sin offering when he stood as a sinner in, as a sinner in our place and received the judgment we deserve. Jesus removed our plank. Amen. Let's pray. Father God, we just thank you, Lord. I thank you for your word. Father, I pray that, uh, Lord, some of what you had me speak this evening, Lord, will go deep into our hearts. Father, we will uh, get our hearts and just our total lives right before you. Give us opportunity to minister to others and those hurting souls out there, Lord. Father, we thank you and we praise you. In Jesus' name, amen.